And before I introduce Brett, I, I want to mention that uh, Brett was very gracious when I talked to him. Uh, he said he didn't need travel money because he's coming home. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he, he didn't accept our honor for an honorarium and said instead of people are so inclined, they could make donations to the Citizens Climate Lobby. So we've got information back there at the table if you want to do that. And also we did Indivisible Bemidji is footing the bill for the room rental. So there's a donation little blue thing back there. If you want to put a few bucks in to cover, cover those expenses, that would also be appreciated. So uh, I have to say in terms of being able to introduce people, it really is special for me to be able to introduce Brett. So I have considered Brett a friend since his youth. Uh, we discovered that we shared great keen interest and passion for doing things in the outdoors and so so uh, it makes it extra special to be able to introduce him here uh, he's been volunteering with CCL since 2011 he now serves as the vice president of programs where he strives to develop learning pathways that create the most empowered and informed citizens lobbyists possible. So the whole network of people around the country that lobby on climate policy. So he's got great responsibility there. Brett has, uh, in terms of the personal background, I can say that he's had a positive influence on our community since he was very young, bringing a lot of enthusiasm, positive energy, been involved in lots of things. And uh, one thing noteworthy worthy is he was the first Green Corps member for Bemidji State University's Sustainability Office. <laughs> he began his career in Northern Minnesota as a Wilderness Program Director and Lead Instructor for several outdoor education nonprofits, including Outward Bound, connecting civic engagement with democratic participation and issues-based advocacy. Brett has taught undergraduate policy courses high school social studies and campus sustainability with dual master's degrees in education and legislative studies. And Dr. Cease holds a PhD in public policy and political economy. So please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Is this uh, mic hot enough or should I try this one? Can you hear me okay? All right, let's try that. Testing, testing, can you hear me? Nope. Okay, cool, I'll use this one. I turned it off, so oh, I'll, I'll turn it back thank on. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here. It's a beautiful homecoming. It's so good to see so many family and friends here. And how about this, is this a little better? Yes. Awesome. And hello to all of our online attendees. We're so glad that you're here. And uh, again, for anyone that wants to follow along at home, whether you're in the room or with us online, the whole slide deck is available at cclusa.org forward slash Bemidji, because we're that special, dash slides. So um, all of the footnotes I'll highlight tonight from the resources, et cetera, are available for you, and uh, we want to make this very accessible. I'll also just highlight that at the very end, if you are so inspired, a lot of the information, especially on the saving money on the rebate side of things, we've got great handouts, too, that you can bring home with you. Um, so I'm going to skip uh, what I normally do with my own bio, and since Pat did that so eloquently already, um, and I'll just share what my goals are here for the next hour and 20-ish uh, together with you, and uh, afterwards I'm more than happy to catch up too because I know it's been a long time since I've seen some of you here. Uh, but I'd like to just center us first in what brings you here tonight. We'll then think through some of the home rebate and incentives available for you through the Inflation Reduction Act, henceforth known as IRA for the rest of the night, your favorite uncle. Uh, we'll then open it up for a Q&A discussion. And then after that, the last, uh, that'll probably take us through the first hour or so. Um, I'd like to just expand that scope a little bit more, talk about what we're up to with CCL overall nationally, have more Q&A, and then end with uh, emphatic uh, encouragement for us to take some action opportunities together, including supporting the amazing work that the other co-sponsors of uh, this event tonight had. So again, a big special thank you to all the co-sponsors. And as a educator, I always want to name my learning goals up front. I hope that you are educated in especially those home upgrade incentives. I hope that you feel a little bit more comfortable navigating them. 
as well as finding out about what CCL is up to. But most importantly, I hope that you are inspired to take action, whether it's a big one, a small one at home afterwards tonight. Hope that there's something you can kind of sink your teeth into and explore after tonight. So it's not just a little seminar. My hope is really to make this interactive as possible. Uh, but first and foremost, Pat hinted a little bit. Pat is actually the first person that ever took me to the Boundary Waters. So a big shout out to Pat. Um, I would probably not have been even on the path uh, that I found myself without you, Pat. So um, just a big shout out um, to the mentors in our lives. There's a lot of you in the room here tonight for me. And that led me on a course that I'll just briefly share about here um, regarding kind of my own um, wilderness um, education journey. But what the lens that I'd like for each of you tonight to think about too, um, well, I just shared this, is you came here for a reason. What is it that you care about that brings you here tonight to fight for a livable planet for future generations? I will ask you actually in just a minute after I share a quick one minute summary for my story for you to kind of turn to a partner, whether it's somebody you came in with or somebody that you find yourself randomly sitting with to share that, because I think that helps activate us all to take deeper action. Uh, but for me, I probably would still be doing this kind of work out with Outward Bound or Amnicon or any of these other nonprofits had it not been for a CCL regional conference uh, back 15 years ago now almost, where the lead forestry researcher for the University of Minnesota, Dr. Lee Freelich, I know several of you around the room also um, have met and respect Dr. Lee Freelich's work, basically said with very clear-eyed conviction, Business as usual emission scenarios means that the boundary waters, the boreal forest that we love, the entire ecosystem that we have grown up cherishing, and our way of life, our traditions are at risk, even within our lifetime, if we don't figure out a way to transition off of the energy that we're using right now. And so that was my wake-up call to continue to enjoy the outdoors, but to really shift career paths. And I really credit the work that climate researchers are doing day in and day out right now to help all of us have a clearer picture around the challenges that we face, but also the opportunities. And that's really what we're gonna be focusing on tonight. There's a lot of scary things that you can read about, and I'm sure that have motivated all of us to really try to find out a little bit more about climate, but tonight we're really focusing on the solutions that are already out there. And so that's the scoping that I'm going to be focusing on tonight. Uh, but let's give it back to you. Uh, I'd like to just take this to the 45 minute mark, so two, three minutes. Turn to somebody else next to you and just share a little bit about what brought you here tonight, what motivates you to take action, what's kind of a story that you have about why you care about climate and future generations. And I'll bring us back here in a couple minutes. <laughs> All right, so here, here is also my motivation. If you haven't had a chance yet to meet Shonix and Quest, these are my two sons. Obviously, I know that we're all fighting hard and finding ways in our own lives to make sure that our future generations have just as much opportunity and the chance to experience the amazing world that we live in today. Um, so here is to you, Shonix and Quest, and everyone that you named in your lives that is motivating you, that is bringing you here tonight, that is helping us do the shared work that we can do together. So what I'd like to do actually is just also, I know that last month you already had another wonderful seminar with expertise from Beltrami Electric and several other providers around what's already out there. And what I want to do tonight is start with that since that's what the session promised, but also not spend too much time on that if you already feel like you have the grounding on it. Um, so what Linda has just done is pass around one of the handouts that CCL has you can reference it tonight if you want. There's a lot of fine print, but basically it's a little cheat sheet after tonight that you can take home. That really walks through a lot of what you have available for you with your new renewable energy bank account um, or clean energy bank account, whatever you want to think about it with a lot of the Inflation Reduction Act benefits. But first and foremost, just because um, social proof is so powerful, I would love you to raise your hand if you have had the chance to implement any of the following in your own home yet a home heat pump space heater, excellent, a heat pump water heater, excellent, an induction stove, excellent, home weatherization, I love it, look at all these experts here, oh, Mindy's <laughs> raise your hand online here too, excellent, solar panels, 
beautiful battery storage system cutting edge good work i'm impressed with you mr hub electric car excellent and how many of you are excited to maybe try that after tonight at this point? I'm just going to do a quick pre-post poll. Okay, well, we already got a high bar. All right, let's see if I run it. All right, so that's great. We already have a lot of experts after this tonight because I think really one of the big barriers is that people feel like, especially here in the northern climate, we're not doing it. We don't know people. We don't have a lot of um, chance to kind of learn about it from others, that peer learning. But look around the room. That's already out there. So let's keep sharing that after tonight. Um, so I'll, dump, I'll jump in right here for the first half talking about one of our four key policy areas that CCL is focusing on, and that is building electrification. And in a nutshell, really the reason why we're so focused on it is that there's such a huge opportunity, as we all know, to find alternative solutions to decarbonize and find ways to not only make our buildings more energy efficient, but to also eliminate major sources of pollution, both from uh, CO2 or carbon dioxide, but also indoor air pollution that we'll cover in just a little bit. And we like to think about this as a win-win-win solution. So one, you can save money, right? Estimates from uh, Rocky Mountain Institute or RMI or Resources for the Future, a lot of these other firms that we cite, highlight that households on average can save almost $2,000 a year by going fully electric. It's also a win on health, right? Because we know fossil fuel indoor air pollution is actually a major source of health problems, especially for children and childhood asthma, um, but also just um, breathing in all of those emissions, whether it's from our vehicles, our stoves, you name it, isn't good for any of us. And then also clearly on the climate front too, really finding a way for a win on how we can transition away from fossil fuels, um, given their emissions and the role that they play in heat trapping uh, for our atmosphere. So what I'd like to do here to start with is just highlight a couple of charts, another kind of visual way to kind of make the case for transitioning and electrifying our lives. So this first layer that we have here is just the electricity prices over the last 25 years. You can see there's some volatility over you know, the annual season, uh, but also over time, especially kind of with the inflation of the last couple of years. But overall, pretty reasonably predictable, right? Not a lot of great ups and downs, you know, within 5% really of kind of that baseline price. And we know this because uh, in many ways, electricity is well diversified. We get all electricity from a lot of sources. We're not dependent on one place to generate our electricity right now. And we also know that basically electricity is efficient. Uh, when you burn fossil fuels, there's a lot of energy that's lost outside of kind of what you use it and uh, essentially generate for heat. And so let's layer on natural gas. You can see again, a lot more volatility, especially with the recent uh, war in Ukraine. A lot of the earlier instability um, heading into the early thousands. You can see again when we depend on fossil fuel for our heat energy sources, we're signing up for a wilder rodeo. And then even more so, not only for our actual kind of home um, appliances, but also if we layer on gasoline, look at those wild swings. We know gasoline is also even a driver of inflationary spikes sometimes. Uh, but look at that unpredictability. Wide swings back and forth huge selling point for, again, finding ways for us all to electrify our vehicles. And I put that in the context of, in the last several years, the amazing achievement, really the largest bill that's ever been addressed and signed in Congress on climate, happened in 2022, the Inflation Reduction Act. And one of the many pieces that it had was basically pouring in four to $500 billion in clean energy for all of us to benefit from. We're just starting to see those benefits in our communities today. Uh, but essentially, some of those include saving car owners over $500 a year. Again, this is an estimate from a well-respected um, think tank, RFF, thanks to lower EV fuel costs. Uh, I know we have an amazing op-ed recently that Ron Erickson wrote in The Pioneer that I read earlier this week again, um, talking about the benefits again of that. We have household benefits from saving electricity costs, estimated to be $200 a year and having those tax rebates and or tax credits and rebates for electri uh, electrification efficiency. Now, how I'm gonna frame, again, a little bit more of this discussion, this first part is a great um, uh, drawing that you can see by an artist that we have uh, cited in the speaker notes here uh, that really goes room by room. You can kind of see from the roof on down a lot of the opportunities that we have available for us, but you don't have to take my word for it. Let's hear from Linda. <laughs> Tax credits for electrification and efficiency are available now and continue throughout the life of the Inflation Reduction Act. What is the life of the Inflation Reduction Act? You might ask Linda. 
the next 10 years, or really nine years now. So the clock is ticking, and we are excited about figuring out what each of you can benefit from. Another wonderful opportunity that each of you have, whether you're listening in right now on the computer or um, here in the room live, is if you just search for Rewiring America's Savings Calculator, we have a short link to it as well. Uh, we've partnered with Rewiring America, as of a lot of climate groups, at cclusa.org forward slash IRA calc. I think that's actually even on your handout. But the great thing about it is that it can tell based on your income level, because there's certain parts of the, uh, the bill that basically are capped depending on how much money you make, what you qualify for across each of these areas that we're going to review. And so again, it's especially trying to help out lower income earning households, which they define as 80% of the median household income wherever you live. So it is basically regionally uh, varies as well. And then also middle income earners are defined as basically 80% to 150% of the um, uh, median income earning. And we'll, t we'll get into the details of that in just a little bit. But one other visual that I think is helpful for us to think about tonight is there's two big buckets that we'll be talking about that you as homeowners or you know, uh, car drivers, whatever you wanna kind of think of your identity as can benefit from. One of them are upfront tax credits that are available right now. They were available immediately after the act passed. And basically that comes on your next year's federal tax returns that you can reduce down. The other are rebates. And basically those are still being sorted out state by state. Uh, they will be available up front. So uh, rather than having to wait, the real benefit of a rebate is obviously having that be uh, money that you don't even have to pay from the direct price. The unfortunate part of that is that they still aren't currently available. So let's explore just a little bit more about your home electrification bank account. As I've highlighted, the tax credits right now are available. They'll be applied to your next year's federal tax filings. Uh, they're non-refundable, and they're, uh, what that basically means is if you have up to $1,200, say, of um, you know, tax credits that you're eligible for because of the big project you put in, you're only able to have a certain amount applied, and then that extra amount doesn't go above and beyond. So they reset every year, though. So you want to be a little bit strategic about how much you do. We definitely recommend staggering your projects so that you can kind of have them throughout every year and not kind of go on top of the amount that you'd be eligible for getting. Um, there's also energy efficiency home improvement tax credits up to 30%. Um, so that means up to $2,000 depending on the project cost for heat pumps. If you haven't installed one of those yet or heat water heaters. Um, you also have $1,200 a year for other upgrades from weather, uh, uh, weatherization, energy efficiency upgrades, you name it. And again, the great benefit of the um, tax credit side of things is that account resets every year. And then the great thing, I would say, one of the most unsung pieces of the Inflation Reduction Act is that uh, it extended the 30% tax credit to battery storage, which is up and coming and is absolutely gonna be a huge part of the solution in the next decade. But it also finally provided uh, certainty for solar energy and, and, and wind projects, but especially on the solar front, as many of you know, there was so much uncertainty every year or two with the next energy omnibus bill. Oh, is it gonna be expanded? Are we gonna have our credits? We now finally know, yes, for 10 years, there's this certainty on the solar front. Um, and that is a huge benefit to have that certainty uh, for especially not uh, us as private um, homeowners, but as um, actual private businesses, having that to be able to model is huge with their kind of long-term planning. And then lastly, I'll also highlight this. I realize you can't quite see that. Uh, so that's duly noted. There we go. There's a tax credit as well that we can talk briefly about. All right, so on the upfront side of things, your actual rebate bucket, that is in the works. This next slide after this, we'll talk through where things stand in Minnesota right now. Uh, but basically, we've got HERA and HOMES. So on the HERA end of things, this is especially for uh, lower and middle income earning families. It's up to $14,000 per household and basically per year. And uh, that basically means that if you um, are under 80% income earning for the median income wherever we're at, you get 100% of those costs covered as soon as this rebate is finally up and running and stood up. And if you are a middle income earning household defined as 80 to 150%, you still get half of those costs covered, which is absolutely huge. And then additionally, if you happen to earn more than that amount, the homes rebates settle in as another great opportunity uh, for especially bigger homes or for higher income families um, to also qualify for some home energy savings. 
And the leading edge of the spear right now for um, actually kind of implementing on the state level the Inflation Reduction Act funds are these four states. Uh, give it up for California, Hawaii, New Mexico, New York. They're all estimated to start having their rebates ready to go as of this summer, um, if you wanted to move there. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, here in Minnesota, uh, we are still kind of um, ahead of a lot of the pack for other states. Uh, but basically, you can kind of see through this timeline that we still have several steps in the process. Right now, we are basically um, planning and designing how we're going to implement these from the Commerce Department. That's going to be the agency responsible on the state level here in Minnesota. They will then submit their application on how they plan to do that to the Federal Department of Energy. And then you can see there's a whole bunch of other processes that still need to go in place to finally build, in, implement, and open the program before basically they, at this point now, are, are kind of telling us that we should expect it to be early next year, um, that it's finally gonna be ready on that rebate front. Um, and the great news is this is a 10-year window, so that still gives seven years of eligibility. If you are antsy and you wanna see that move quicker, uh, as an uh, individual, you're always encouraged to uh, let the Commerce Department know you'd love to have that rebate available as soon as you can. Um, but obviously we'll also work on the timeline they have because I know there's great civil servants trying to really make that happen as quick as possible. Um, a couple of the big questions that I get when I talk about where things stand uh, in terms of where things are already at uh, for Minnesota, and this is all again available in the speaker notes too, will there be rebates retroactively? And this is the biggest thing to know, no. The state has been very clear that they will not retroactively rebate anything that you do if you're depending on any of those rebates. So they really encourage you, if you're coming on that, to not do anything until the program is stood up and it's ready uh, because you will not be eligible until it is. Um, there's a lot of great resources out there, a few of them that I can highlight tonight uh, while we wait. Um, the other thing that they are thinking through, part of the complication, is that Minnesota already has a lot of great state energy programs um, you know, to basically incentivize people to start electrifying and making the switch for their appliances. And they're really trying to be intentional to not have the additional federal incentives um, replace, but instead augment those current rebates. So that kind of question about how will they interact, they're still figuring that out, but the goal again is for them to stack, not to replace each other and to have even more savings possible. Um, so just know that if you have more questions specifically about the Minnesota program, you can just Google uh, the Minnesota Department of Commerce. They have a whole page all about how they're rolling out the Inflation Reduction Act funds. You can even sign up to have email alerts. They send uh, one about once a month, um, and that would be where to go if you are curious. All right, so let's dive into some of these appliances available. So the first thing that I'll start with here is just highlighting again the opportunity you can see that from the top part of uh, this graph, so these are all the different household end use consumption uh, big appliances that we all probably have in our homes. The huge opportunity that we have on all of these, again, so this is the amount of energy that is being consumed by each of them. Blue is electricity, we like that, right? Because we can kind of control the sourcing of that in a lot more renewable direction. This light blue though is natural gas. And so look at that opportunity that we have for both space heating and water heating. It's definitely the biggest part of the wedge. It's the biggest opportunity each of us have in our homes to think through how to electrify. And the great news is that, we've already talked about it, there is a device that can do just that for both of those. It's called a heat pump. All right, who's excited about heat pumps tonight? A little bit more? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. I know my parents put one in, they love it. Um, and uh, basically, obviously, the, um, the heat pump technology has been around for a long time, but they're getting more and more dialed in, especially for cool weather climates. Uh, and the key thing to highlight here um, is just basically that they are incredibly more efficient, three to five times more, depending on what you're looking at, uh, than fossil fuel heating systems. It's easier, you know, the bottom line is it's easier to move heat around than to actually create it itself. So that's really what they do with those, the fans that they have, right? They're regulating the fan, just move that air from one place to another rather than have to generate themselves. And because they're so efficient, they generate uh, far fewer emissions and save us energy as homeowners. And so what you might be saying, oh, what does that look like? Well, it depends on obviously where you're already at. Uh, with, uh, I'm just clicking around here now, we're talking. All right, so depending on uh, what you're already using, you can kind of use this chart to compare the average annual savings that a homeowner might see if you have a current natural gas furnace, a uh, fuel oil burner, uh, you name it, or boiler, you name it. Um, they're all here. And uh, again, this is all great information from Rewiring America on this slide that you can kind of check out more at your own leisure. 
Uh, but the other thing I want to really speak to tonight uh, in terms of us as hardy northern Minnesotans <coughs> braving the snow in mid-April to come here listening to Brett talk tonight is that they work in cold climates. It is okay to think about um, heat pumps as well in this area. Um, there's already one model out there, at least, uh, that uh, goes down to 13 below. There's companies that are continuing to develop ones that can work even below 20 below. Um, this is a great stat. Uh, if we look to our Nordic neighbors and uh, ancestors, 6% of homes in Norway, 43% of homes in Sweden, 41% in Finland have heat pumps. So they're incredibly well adopted. And that's also coming uh, to be the case here in the US. In just the last couple of years, in Maine alone, another cold weather climate friend, 100,000 heat pumps were installed. Um, and another 175,000 that one state, again, smaller than us even, are anticipated to be installed in the next several years. So the trend is definitely heading in the right direction. You too can be part of that curve. Um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that specifically if you have any questions, um, you know, kind of on the uh, cold weather front after we go through the slides. Um, the two things that I wanted to highlight again as a reminder, so HERA, the High Efficiency Electric Home Rebate Act, will, when the Minnesota Department of Commerce stands this program up, hopefully uh, it should say 2025 there rather than 2024, um, can provide an upfront discount for heat pumps up to $8,000. That's gonna be huge. I'm, I'm telling you this to get ready so that when that program is ready, you are ready to jump um, and especially if you are a low income household, that's 100% of the cost covered for you. What a great incentive. Middle income earners, again, 50%. And if you're curious specifically about where this is at, kind of within what the amended uh, you know, Internal Revenue Tax Code was at, it's Section 25C. Um, and that 30% uh, tax rate is up to $2,000 now. So the HERA is the rebate, and that's going to happen as soon as Minnesota goes live with the program. If you're really antsy and you just want to do a heat pump tonight, you can still get up to $2,000 off from an actual tax credit now, so not the rebate, if that distinction makes sense. Heat pump water heaters, another great technology, right? They work the same way. They're also incredibly efficient. This also translates to huge energy savings. We are big fans of them as well. Um, I don't really have too much more to say about that beyond kind of what you can anticipate in costs. Again, you can look at that being covered up to $1,750. Um, as of next year, um, uh, if for 100% uh, for low-income households, 50% for mid-income households, and again, uh, right now there is already currently tax credits available up to 2,000 um, for individuals that are installing them this year. All right, so let's switch over to stoves. Obviously, I saw a couple of hands already trying out the induction method. We know that uh, on the traditional end, we all grew up loving our stove and you know, great, they're a fine technology, but the real cutting edge of what induction offers is a more efficient experience. It transfers energy actually to the pot through magnetism, which is amazing. Um, they're incredibly more efficient um, electricity-wise than gas or electric stoves, and they're accurate, fast, safe. The actual cooking top surface doesn't get very hot. And the key thing here again is health. Um, one study that was a meta-analysis of many other studies that looked at what happened when you have a natural gas stove in your home found that about 1% of the actual kind of gas leaked. Just again, because it's a gas and you know, pipe fittings are not always the most well sealed into your actual home. So that benzene, toluene, all the other harmful or, uh, organic and inorganic chemicals you're breathing in, that's causing obviously a lot of indoor air pollution why wouldn't you want to kind of find a way to get off that off-ramp as quick as possible? Um, again, specifically looking at um, the kid health impact, 2013, another meta-analysis of 41 studies found that kids living at homes with gas stoves had 42% higher risk of experiencing asthma symptoms. Um, a pretty significant influence there, again, uh, correlative, uh, not causational, but still a pretty high um, coincidence there. Uh, and then in 2022, a study found that in the U.S., 35% of home use, uh, homes that use gas stoves are associated then with almost 20%, 6 to 19% of the current childhood asthma cases. So a, a very clear link there. HERA. So let's talk about, again, once we get this program in Minnesota stood up, what is it going to do for induction stoves? It can provide up to $840 of that off 
100% of it for low-income households. Again, you can see the same threshold applied to each of these slides. For middle income earners, 50% of that overall induction stove cost. And then the last thing I'll highlight here uh, before kind of getting into cars, I think, is the heat pump clothes dryer. Does anyone have one of those yet? Excellent. You like it, Ben? Love it. I love it. All right. So talk to Ben if you haven't explored that as a concept after this. Uh, and basically, again, $840 for this appliance as well. Incredibly uh, affordable already, and that makes it even more incentivized. All right, so let's transition briefly to weatherization. Obviously, this is the idea of how can we make our building envelope more efficient to not leak heat, especially in the winter, or to keep the cool air in the summer in, uh, and really look at the overall design from air sealing, insulation, door and window upgrades, ventilation improvements. As homeowners, you already had a lot of write-offs available to you um, uh, kind of for window improvements or whatever you uh, have um, for many years. But now, especially with the Inflation Reduction Act, um, even a home energy audit is covered. 30% uh, tax credit right now, up to $150 for that. So if you haven't thought about that, that's the most important first step to thinking about how to make your home more efficient. Um, and then th here's a couple of key statistics that I've found to kind of be motivating to think about doing this in your own lives. Um, one is up to 20% of the money spent on home energy is actually wasted because of inefficiencies that could be taken care of if, if you made upgrades, if you made sure to kind of make your home more energy, energy efficiency. Uh, obviously it lowers uh, both waste and bills. And especially for lower income households, um, there's been studies that have highlighted that over a third of their energy bill um, could be highlighted through weatherization projects. Now, a lot of that challenge also comes from low-income households um, also being renters and having kind of a split incentive to not be the ones in control of making some of those improvements. Uh, but definitely know, regardless, uh, there's great incentives. And if you happen to um, you know, encourage your landlord to be more efficient and save money at the same time, great. On the um, key refund for weatherization incentives, that is going to allow up to $1,600 a year once the rebate goes live, presumably next year. I should have updated each of these slides. They keep saying 2024, but that, again, is 2025 at this point, likely. Uh, and again, 100% covered costs for low income, et cetera. And then right now, what is available for tax credits um, are uh, up to $1,200 a year. You can kind of see how these are split out between energy audits, insulation, air sealing, doors, and windows. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can talk to our friend, Polly. Polly says this, if we had done this in 2024, we would be eligible for $1,200 in tax credits. Even better, we could do this over time and do projects annually to receive up to $1,200 a year for 10 years and get that tax credit every year. So again, speaking to the importance of um, spreading out those improvements so you don't just have one big bill one year, but taking advantage of the incentives, um, you know, the tax incentives every year over time. All right, um, I'm gonna skip ahead to EVs. Again, how many EVs out there already? Excellent, I love it. Thank you for um, braving um, this new direction that I think the entire market is going in. Um, we know obviously on a core level, the electric vehicles are more efficient, they save money. They have uh, already studies have highlighted one third the fuel cost per mile driven and about one half the maintenance cost, which I feel is high, but that's, you know, again, um, citing some of the studies that are in the footnotes here. We know that they're also uh, better for health and the environment from uh, reduced air uh, pollution from no tailpipe emissions, lower lifetime greenhouse gas emissions. The um, mining for battery components like lithium happens once as opposed to the fuel that you need to drive your current internal combustion vehicle. Um, happens every day that you need to have uh, gas fuel up in it, right? Um, so it, it's all kind of bound up in that. And you don't have to take my word for that. You can also hear from Ron. Um, these Pioneer Series articles are great, by the way. Big shout out to the Pioneer for featuring each of these voices. Uh, Ron's article on driving a Tesla was wonderful. And uh, I don't know, is Ron here tonight? Okay, excellent. I thought I saw maybe him walk in there. Um, so one of the questions people often get around EVs is, okay, well, yeah, I'm going to charge it. But like, oh, if I'm only using coal to generate the electricity, isn't it actually worse for the environment? Uh, one of the great charts out there that shows, well, that's probably not the case, um, is this great study uh, from RMI, which is basically showing, uh, depending on the grid where you live, which there's many, as you can see, uh, that the miles per gallon equivalent of driving your EV compared to a gas vehicle 
Right now, with the current grid, and keep in mind, obviously, we're trending in the direction of more and more renewables uh, supplying our grid, is so forth. So for each of these different areas, you can see, obviously, some of the grids are incredibly clean. You know, on the West Coast, we got uh, miles per gallon over 100. Even here in the Midwest right now, you know, again, still something that a Prius can't beat. Uh, so 67 miles per gallon, I definitely would estimate that that is a significant improvement to what you drove um, with your internal combustion vehicle. So what are the actual incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act for EVs? Well, it depends on if you're getting a new or a used one. Uh, the new ones right now are already kind of available for tax credits. Um, and the kind of complicated piece on this is that the incentives were also really trying to encourage our supply chain to move domestically. Um, so the long of it is basically that they have to meet certain criteria if um, especially the overall cost is under 55,000 and then you can kind of see depending on if it's an SUV or a van or a truck that might differ. Uh, differ. You as an individual or family also are income bound. Um, so you only qualify for that new one if you earn $150,000 if you file um, as a single or, or $300,000 if you're filing as a joint married couple. Um, and then it's broken down in half. So you would get half of that tax credit if most of the battery's critical minerals um, uh, to produce that battery come from US or our trade partners. And then you'd also get half of that credit if the battery components were made and assembled in the USA. And the interesting loophole in all of this is that if you lease an EV, you automatically, if you meet that income threshold, get that tax credit. So I don't know if that's a helpful distinction. Um, and I've got Q&A and just two more slides here. Um, but that is kind of the new EV incentive side of things. And uh, basically the other bullet here says that this year the tax credits become transferable to auto dealers, essentially converting them to upfront discounts to incentivize even more of a, a reason for dealers to feature electric vehicles in their fleets. So if you're on the use front, which I will be, um, this is a little bit less money, no surprise, but also some great incentives. Um, basically, uh, and this is currently available, this isn't a rebate, this is a tax incentive available for you today if you're looking at this. And Minnesota also has some additional programs that can stack on this if you're um, curious about. Um, but the lesser of either $4,000 or 30% of the sales price if they meet their following criteria, the income earning threshold is significantly lower. It's half of what it is for a new one. Uh, the EV has to be at least two years old and you can see so forth kind of for the rest of um, these qualifications on kind of what you are looking for if you're trying to get that tax incentive for a used EV. Um, and then the last thing I'll just highlight here is on the EV charger front. Obviously it's great to have an EV, uh, but if you just plug it into the wall without an upgrade to your charging, it's gonna take a long time to um, actually get that fully charged. So you probably wanna think at the same time about upgrading uh, to having a higher um, charging station at home. Um, there's additional incentives for that. 30% tax credit up to $1,000 if you're living in a non-urban, Bemidji, uh, community. Uh, low income refers to communities in one of the following, and uh, we obviously already qualify given um, the definition of being non-urban. Um, and then also with storage too. So um, I'm gonna actually just, I'm gonna end right here and then I can go back to anything that I've whipped through here for the first half. But just to stay on track, the last thing I'll highlight here, um, and Anna can speak to this too, uh, given um, her work, and I know Linda as well, um, just with the amazing work that the clean energy resources teams uh, do, uh, that uh, they, I would say, I've looked all over for other ways to interpret kind of how to apply what the Inflation Reduction Act looks like here in Minnesota. I would point everyone to certs. Uh, they have amazing toolkits you can see here on the right-hand side, all of these different guides, depending on what you want to look at after tonight, given how quickly we're talking through things, it'll walk you through things. They have webinars by each of these topics. You can sign up to receive email updates on each of them. They have toolkits, and if you're so incentivized, you can even become an Inflation Reduction Act ambassador <laughs> through CERTS and give talks like this. Um, so definitely a big shout out to CERTS. Check them out online afterwards tonight as kind of the next best place to find out more information. Uh, but I wanted to save um, 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, I don't know if we have any online, Jordan, uh, or in the room. I'm happy to kind of be a roving mic and uh, see Dan's hand first here, and then we'll kind of go to the policy agenda next. Dan, what do you think? So if you have 
an existing heat pump now, let's say six years and maybe in need of replacement, does that, can you still get the tax credit and the upfront match with that? For the new appliance? For the new one? Yes. Even though you have an existing one? I believe so. Yes. Yeah, it's, sure. it's based on the appliance. Okay. You have experience, Charlie? And then one year, and it just replaced it before these things became available, but uh, we got everything that the state gave. And then what is the what is the requirement for having it installed? Could the homeowner do it, or does it have to be through an established installer? That's, I don't know if anyone knows. So the questions uh, uh, basically from Dan are, if you already have a heat pump, can you still get the credit? Um, if you install a new one, yes, we have lived experience there. And then is there a certain requirement in terms of the installation? Um, I believe that you just have to show the cost from the receipt and that it's not attached to the installation. But Pat, do you have experience? I was gonna say on the first question, as an economist, I got a scientist or research this stuff. It's 25C that he was referring to, and the requirement for an air source heat pump is just, it's going into an existing building. So it doesn't really matter what your previous situation is. It's that is not eligible for new construction. Okay. But it might be a good idea to wait a year or two when the state right. incentives will come in too for any new construction. And, and looking at the tax forms as I did, all you, all you have to do is provide the documentation that it meets the, the energy efficiency requirements to be eligible, the SEER rating and the tons of the, and so looking at this stuff, the thing that they promote the most for do-it-yourself is the air source ductless heat pumps, the mini splits, and definitely people are getting that do-it-yourself. Those are great questions, thank you, Pat. Thank you, Dan, who else? Excellent. I'm great. Um, my question is, what's CCL's position about the administration allowing the auto manufacturers to include the plug-in hybrids to help meet the production match um, goals? As I recall, there's some new information on that front. To kind of expand the eligibility? So what is our position about kind of the expansion of the uh, tax incentive to include plug-in hybrids? I mean, I, I think at this point, I am not a full expert on that, and I would just say, however, we can encourage people to make the transition, and having that expansion is a good thing in many ways. For people here, I'm guessing there are plug-in hybrid drivers as well, and that's a great way to kind of ease into the EV market. So. I don't know if you have thoughts one way yourself, uh, Brick, uh, Brick, but uh, that would be my response. Yeah, well, I, I think it's a good idea to allow a certain amount of that. Yes, sure. yeah, agreed. Yeah, to even expand that further. So it's not just full EVs, but also plug-in hybrids. Thank you for clarifying. It's okay not to have questions, too. <laughs> Please, Sharon. Yeah. Uh, I asked the uh, company that provides heating and cooling in my house about a um, heat pump water heater and I was discouraged uh, about getting one. Two reasons, they talked about the temperature uh, in this part of the, of the country. The other thing they said was it required such a large space hmm. in the basement where, or wherever the heat, uh, water heat would be located and I wondered if that's something you could address. Yeah. Well, um, I will try to see if I can get more space in your basement. Um, but I think there's barriers, right? Like I, um, you know, in my enthusiasm and zeal for talking about these technologies, don't overlook the fact that there are challenges in making any transition, whether it's uh, labor force and training um, and helping people kind of get up to speed on a lot of the new opportunities that we have with appliances coming down the pipeline. Uh, whether it's the space that we have in our homes that were designed for a certain size appliance now um, that looks different. Um, obviously, those are huge barriers. And then, especially too, uh, with the climate that we're in, um, having the chance to have backup still is a strong recommendation uh, that installers will tell you, you know, not to fully make the switch to a, you know, a air or ground source heat pump because we may still have several days of 40 below weather right now and we don't have heat pump technology to fully get to that coverage yet. 
Um, and so in many ways, people are bridging kind of that transition and being efficient a lot of those days of the year uh, without having to fully kind of replace what their current, um, you know, natural gas furnace or whatever they have kind of for their heater. Um, and so unfortunately, without kind of having more, I mean, I think the real benefit is when we have efficiencies of scale, when we start really being able to produce these on a higher level, um, the size are the the size will go down. The dimensions will probably fit better. Um, right now, obviously, I think that is a barrier, and especially if it isn't a good fit and you've had the chance to talk to an installer, um, I would say the biggest thing is to kind of start networking with each other and learn who does have one, how it works for them. Is there something that they wish they would have known? that you can learn kind of from their installation in your home and really use that kind of social um, kind of learning model. And it's already great and inspirational throughout tonight to see us raise our hands because you know there's so many of us that are trying one of these things out but maybe not all of them yet. So really lean on the peer network that you have. Um, and again, the great thing is also the incentives are set up so you don't have to make all these immediate, you know, the transition is not gonna happen all appliances overnight. Focus on one that you think is most realistic for your home and then kind of build from there would be my recommendation. But thank you for naming the bureaus because they're they're real, right? I mean, they're really important considerations. All right. Am I still on? It looks like, oh, sounds like it ended here. Here we go, testing. Testing, all right, perfect. All right, John Philpa is jumping in here too, all right. So um, I'm gonna uh, go on to the second half if that's all right. Um, and then, um, obviously, if we have other questions, I've built in more Q&A time. Um, but let's transition from thinking about things in our own homes, in our own lives, and the opportunities that we have. And uh, please feel free to reference and bring home all of those incentives that you have on that sheet that we handed out. And let's talk just a little bit more about what we're focusing on CCL-wise with the policy agenda that we have laid for it. And just so, you know, I know a lot of you already know, but just in case if you're tuning in here online or if you're not familiar, Citizens Climate Lobby, CCL, is the organization I work for. We're a national nonprofit that's a nonpartisan entity that has about 400 chapters throughout the U.S. and another 150 or so throughout the larger world. We're active in over 80 countries, and we're explicitly focused on building the political will for a livable world through enabling all of us to experience breakthroughs in exercising our personal and political power. And what does that mean? Well, you get to define that, you get to co-create that with us, uh, but really at the heart of it, what it means is that we realize that we have an untapped potential as concerned constituents or citizens have you, uh, to engage our government in being a part of co-creating the solutions that we need and the policies that we need to see enacted to make sure that the challenge that we face with climate change is addressed. And so essentially what all 400 plus of our chapters in this country are really focusing on, and the beautiful magic is that each of them has their own you know, special recipe of which of these they're focusing on and how they're doing it in their community, um, are the following four policy agenda items. We talked already about the building electrification and efficiency front, so I won't really go into that at all anymore. Uh, but the other three that we are gonna talk briefly about are carbon pricing, healthy forests, and then clean energy permitting reform. And before I do that, let me just, since I like charts and kind of being able to visualize what uh, the actual impact of this is, the concept again of reducing our emissions of getting us down to net zero, you know, kind of no additional emissions by the middle of this century, so 2050, which is crazy to think about, but that is literally 26 years from now. It's not some far off find the sky number. It is, um, you know, very um, upfront and close. Here is a chart that shows across each of the policy agenda areas how they're additive to what we want to do to get there. So right now, this blue line shows the emissions that we currently have as a US um, kind of body. And you can see kind of this dotted line right here is what we've pledged basically in the Paris Agreement to get 50% below by um, the 20, uh, 2005 levels. So not going probably at the rate that we need to to reach the goal that we have. So um, right now, if we are to kind of model out what's gonna happen if nothing happens with other additional policies, here's where we'd get we'd be able to reduce emissions 28, uh, you know, 28 percent per our 2005 levels. And we know that again, our goal that we set forth is to get to net zero by 2050 and by 2030, we wanna get below 50 percent. 
So how are we gonna get there? We're gonna accelerate the way that we can deploy clean energy, so permitting reform. We're gonna have a carbon price. We'll get into that in just a little bit. We're going to think about what our forests can do to continue to sequester carbon and play a critical role that they always have been on even a larger stage. And then ideally, we're gonna look at how each of us can help out on the building efficiency and electrification front. And again, depending on what order you place these, sometimes the wedges would change. Like if we just focused on, if we only did building electri uh, electrification, would it only be 6% still? No, it would probably be more than that. But cumulatively, you can kind of see the relative impact that each of them play in our goal again of getting well below 50% in the next decade. So uh, we talked about uh, the building electrification front. So I'm gonna just skip right through it for now. And let me just kind of start with a review of why CCL has really always seen carbon pricing to be our flagship policy. If you remember back, you know, I know looking around the room, there's a couple people even that in 2011 were in the BSU basement and Mark Reynolds, the executive director of CCL, gave a group start for uh, the Bemidji chapter. And that was really what CCL was known for back then. We were advancing something called carbon fee and dividend we would have something called a carbon border adjustment. We'll get into that in a little bit. And the whole goal is to not only lower emissions, but to help all of us be co-creators in putting solutions to work and having affordable clean energy available to us. So what does that actually look like? We know that carbon pricing can actually impact every sector of our economy. It basically charges a fee for people that are right now uh, producing the fossil fuel. So as upstream as possible in our economy, and then, you know what, actually, I think I have a chart at the very end of this that I think I prefer, just because it's a lot more helpful visually how it works. Here we go. All right, so three-legged three, three scope, here we go. Number one, you charge a fee on fossil fuels at the source, where, where that fossil fuel first enters our economy, at the mine, at the well, or the port. You then, what do you do with that money? There's a lot of revenue generated. You actually give it back to the people. And obviously there's gonna be a lot of powerful interests that wanna suggest alternative revenue uses, but the reason why we are sticking with and suggesting 100% back to households is twofold. One, we want that fee to keep growing so that we actually are more and more incentivized to get off of fossil fuels in our lives. And the only way that we're gonna have durability with a policy like this is if people see the benefit of it. And the other thing is we don't want a policy to be regressive. One of the biggest critiques of a carbon tax is if it's just a straight tax, the people that get squeezed the most are the people that afford it the least. And so if you throw it, if you pair it with a dividend, it actually comes out so that lower income earners benefit the most. And especially, you know, I think uh, there's another estimate here that I can cite in another study, over two thirds of households will receive more back in that dividend than they'll get from the actual kind of um, uh, fee increases that they'll see. And then the last thing, which is becoming actually more and more important as the EU creates a border carbon adjustment mechanism and other countries and major global players are also starting to think about this, this idea of if we're doing domestic policy well, we wanna incentivize making sure that we are not offshoring other companies to go other places where they can do dirtier industries easier. And so this carbon border adjustment does two things. One, it makes sure that if goods coming in from other countries that have cheap, dirtier manufacturing processes, they would have that levy or that adjustment made of the, uh, the border so that we're not kind of tempted as Americans to buy cheaper, dirtier products. But then also, on the flip side, if we're exporting right now, we don't want to disadvantage our domestic manufacturers from having steeper rules domestically than other competitors foreign-wise. Um, so it would kind of balance the budget, make sure that they're also eligible uh, to have that rebate on the back end, making them competitive internationally. So that's the three-legged stool. Uh, I'm gonna briefly just talk about, again, um, I think I've just whipped through both of these. So um, let's do this. Which country do you think had the world's current highest carbon price as of this time last year? It's $156 per ton of carbon dioxide. How many people think it's A? <laughs> B? C? D? All right, wow, we're all making on E? All right, we gotta do some more geography here. Right. It's actually B. Who knew? Uruguay, leading the way. All right, 
So it's not this pie in the sky concept, right? Other countries are doing this. The craziest thing is, if you look at all of the G20, the biggest global economies, literally, we are the laggard. Everyone else has a carbon price. It might look like a cap and trade system. It might look like a direct price. Uh, you name it, there's a lot of policy designs out there. Australia had one and then they've uh, repealed it. So we in Australia, I should say, are the two laggards and we need to get with the program to enter into the um, kind of international uh, trade regime a much more efficient way. And just to have that kind of momentum to, to highlight, this is an incredibly effective tool, right? Economists around the country are highlighting continually, even after the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, how important the stackable benefits of a carbon price are um, to really continue to amplify our goal for reducing emissions. All right, so that's, that's one of the policy agenda items. Then we've got clean energy permitting reform. And so again, this concept here is that we have a lot of barriers right now in the country for better or worse that are blocking the progress that we need to deploy clean energy at the level and the rate that we need to to meet our climate targets. And this is a little bit nittier and grittier because environmentalists historically have been doing really good things by exercising our muscles by blocking projects. That's probably, you know, around the room, what a lot of us have done as an environmentalist at some point in kind of slowing down energy infrastructure. And obviously, kudos to you for your work in that front, especially if it was something that um, ultimately kind of helped us in this transition on the clean energy front. Uh, but one of the things that's really staggering to me is that when we modeled the Inflation Reduction Act and said, how much emission reductions will it deliver? We assumed a certain amount of transmission build out, a certain amount of clean energy you know, growth rate. And basically we're on track right now to only receive about half of what we thought we'd get unless we can deploy clean energy quicker and more efficiently. So that is the real challenge that we face right now in this country where we have, we're so litigious, we have so many um, legal processes in place to protect private landowners, interests along the route for uh, transmission line, you name it, how can we do things that are more efficient? Well, let's zoom out just real quick and talk about permitting itself. So obviously permitting is this idea of an official authorization to begin a construction project. It exists to protect communities as well as the workers that are part of the project and the environment where that project can be built from undue harm. And we make sure that we obtain permits in this country uh, so that all of those are looked out for, but every permit along the way adds times and it, it also adds expenses to projects that make them less incentivized to do. Uh, so slow is the word of the game. Right now we're only expanding our electric transmission infrastructure at a rate of 1% per year. So in the last 10 years, and I might not have this fully accurate, but if I remember right, in the last 10 years, the amount of high voltage transmission line that the US has built China has built 40 times that amount, and Europe has built 12 times that amount. And so because of the challenges that we have, given, again, our dedication to looking out for impacted communities, ecosystems, you name it, we right now are used to a certain pace that is not matching the scale of the problem that we face. And so really our goal here is what we're advocating for is tripling our capacity by 2050 and kind of cutting down those line projects timeline from 15 years um, to five years or less, ideally. And so what does that look like? Well, there's obviously no silver bullet. Um, streamline, streamline permitting is also fraught with challenges, right? Because then you cut out the ability for communities to have um, extensive impact uh, analysis or uh, input. Um, we don't want to get to, you know, greenlining all projects without rubber, you know, with just a rubber stamp approach. Uh, but we need to find ways to improve kind of not only the ability for us to build that infrastructure faster, but to do it in a way that has um, energy and grid reliability and also is bolstering community involvement. Because one of the other big things is, study after study shows that if communities are involved early and often, not at the very end of when a project is almost about to be built, but when it's being envisioned, when people are thinking about it, when a developer is coming to the community from the very get-go and the jump, if we can identify places that are low conflict, that can be a, um, you know, a source of agreement the overall timeline accelerates drastically. Um, and the other thing that I'll just highlight is this. Um, there is a reason to resist um, permitting reform, right? 
Uh, we are seeing that play out right now in Congress. We're, we've seen that for decades, right? And a lot of that comes from environmental justice communities that are living in Cancer Alley, that are living next to a refinery um, or a, you know, a, a trash incinerator, you name it, that have these terrible air impacts and are trying to you know, fight for their lives to make sure no further impacts are happening to them. Um, and at the same time, we are now in a moment where 93% of the electric capacity that's in this backlog for all of our independent system operators and um, you know, the actual kind of scale to get to the grid is clean energy, wind and solar. And we also know that the kind of the overall kind of global appetite for fossil fuel is expected to peak uh, relatively soon. And so all of these forces are kind of highlighting that faster permitting will actually get us to a place where we're only going to or largely see beneficiating uh, clean energy projects overall. And you can see kind of another one of the benefits here of accelerating um, the actual kind of um, build out of our transmission line. What this chart does, I'm sorry for juggling this, I'll kind of get this out of the way here, is so what these five bars show are different scenarios for how fast we deploy additional transmission or upgrade our tr transmission capacity. And the amount shows how much coal is burned in each scenario. So you can see there's a direct link. The quicker we build out our transmission lines, the quicker we can also phase out coal, right? And all of the impacts that come from, um, from that kind of form of energy being um, still a big part of the grid. So one of the big things that we have been advocating for um, that I can get into a Q&A if you want, we just were on the Hill for it um, this last month with our Conservative Climate Conference. We were in um, offices this last year in uh, November, December for it, is called the Big Wires Act. It's a great acronym, uh, which is all about inner uh, regional grid operating to allow more <coughs> flexibility, to build up more capacity and for grids across regions to have the ability, if there's a demand on one part of our overall grid, to kind of have more capacity to push uh, additional energy towards it and giving those independent operators kind of the chance to build and deploy how they best see fit rather than having a government mandate. Um, so there's a lot of other approaches that I can get into if we want to during Q&A, uh, but essentially the big things that we're looking for and support are we need to build out, obviously, our ability to transmit more clean energy, we need to speed the deployment of it, and we need to make sure that the community's ability to have input are preserved in the process. Um, so that's really our kind of triumvirate focus there. All right, so the last thing I'll just focus on before opening it up for Q&A again, uh, thank you for bearing with me, is, again, another great area of climate solutions, nature-based climate solutions, that I know a lot of you around the room have already been doing in your own lives, in your own uh, backyards, in your own advocacy for many years, and that is through forestry and thinking about land-based solutions. So CCL supports preserving and expanding forests, climate-smart forestry, agriculture, expanding urban forests, with a focus on negative uh, uh, neighborhoods that are negatively impacted on uh, lack of tree <coughs> equity. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. Uh, but especially just showing the benefits of forests. We know everyone loves trees. I'll kind of highlight that in just a little bit. A mathematical proof to demonstrate that. Um, we'll have the chance to also think about kind of lots of coalition partners are out there already doing amazing work on the forestry front, especially here in northern Minnesota. Um, it not only helps us mitigate or draw down carbon, but also adapt to the changing climate that we already are witnessing, all kind of that baked in warming that's gonna happen regardless of how quick we draw down more. Um, and uh, I know that you can talk to a lot of our um, Bemidji leaders, especially for their expertise on that. But here's the mathematical proof. So if you ever think that there is somebody that doesn't love a tree, all you have to do is think about this. The Grinch, who likes the Grinch here? <laughs> okay, great. So this, this is feeding into my proof. All right, so not a most beloved character, but even the Grinch loves trees. So if you can even get somebody as uh, despicable with as small of a heart as the Grinch to care about trees, then you can get anyone to realize kind of the importance that trees play. And let's talk next about the bathtub analogy. Hopefully this has not happened to you, um, but it may have. Uh, basically, forests you can also think of as a bathtub, as a carbon sink, if you will, right? And so let's kind of think about what that looks like, just real quick. Um, number one, so again, 
there's many benefits of having kind of uh, forestry focus, uh, but if a lot of our rest of our um, policy agenda is focusing on how we can reduce emissions, you know, that's where all of these other areas that we've just talked about, carbon pricing, permitting reform, electrification come in. We also need to think about what's already in the bathtub. We have a very full bathtub right now. It isn't just that we need to think about the uh, spigot that's kind of pouring more water in. We also need to think about how we can make that drain bigger. And that's where healthy forests come in, right? This idea of building more resiliency with what we have in our forests already. So we know, studies have shown that 12% of our carbon pollution is removed annually by America's forests. Great work. Uh, not only are they giving us oxygen and the ability to live and thrive on this planet, they're also reducing our carbon pollution. We also know that there's huge untapped potential. We can basically double the amount that they're drawing down right now with solutions uh, that CCL has been excited to help um, advocate for. And some of that comes from reforestation, so planting trees uh, where they used to be. Um, and you can kind of see a breakdown of what that looks like in terms of uh, different kinds of natural solutions that are available for reforestation. Uh, but then you can see the equivalent of the other half comes from all sorts of other great solutions that added up together equate to that same amount. And that is from more effective forestry management, um, cover cropping, biochar, fertilization, a lot of these other ones that are not green are the actual agriculture end of our solutions. And the great thing about this is that, again, we know that foresters, farmers, people that work the land are the ones that live closest to the earth and are also seeing these changes, are having to deal with the increasing uncertainty in their own business model and can also be co-creators and not seen as part of the challenge that we face, but as really part of the people that are making these solutions possible. Um, and that's a kind of framing that we really want to emphasize and are so excited obviously about to work with in CCL. On the urban front, um, I won't get into this as much obviously just because it deals a little bit more with higher density um, environments, but we know that especially communities of color have had severe disadvantage in terms of the tree canopy that's been available to them in their neighborhoods. Uh, especially if you, you know, studies have shown that compared to predominantly white neighborhoods, communities of color have 33 less, 33% uh, less tree canopy in their neighborhoods. Um, and that's also not just based on race or ethnicity, it's also based on income. Poor communities have 41% tree canopy. So one of the other big tools that we're excited about, actually, uh, I should have put Ken here a little bit earlier. Um, he is a big proponent, as we well know, about uh, planting trees. Um, and so getting back to kind of that as one of the solutions. Um, but the last thing here I'll share just on the um, tree canopy front before opening up for Q&A again for another 10, is there's a great tool out there um, this is the visualization of actually the neighborhoods in Duluth, uh, but it, uh, you can kind of check it out here on tree equity. And basically you put in your zip code and it shows neighborhood by neighborhood how um, the kind of overall rubric for how they're scoring neighborhoods kind of on all of these criteria, existing canopy, density, income, employment, all that, how equitable the tree cover is. So you can kind of use this tool to identify in your advocacy where you could help you know, the city really incentivize planting more trees and getting involved on the local level uh, to make sure that there is more equitable tree cover. So we've had other chapters throughout the country really sink their teeth into this last year. Um, this is from our partner, American Forests. Um, they're doing amazing work on uh, the tree canopy front. Um, and if anybody wants to find out more, just go to treeequitystore.org. Um, and that's a really useful tool, especially for urban environments. All right, so I promised you that I'd uh, end at ten, uh, seven. So let's have 10 minutes for a Q&A, and then um, we'll do five minutes for a little action um, roundup at the very end. I see Linda and then Lisa's hand. And Brett, if you would repeat the questions, it's been oh, yes. folks on Zoom are able to hear it. And is there any online? None yet. Okay, great. No. Okay, so the tree equity. Yes. Um, is there a planner who would be able to come into the neighborhood and say, okay, you can put your solar panels here and plant trees here so that you are not covering up your solar panels with the tree shade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, so the question is, how do you balance all of these development needs from you know reforesting to developing solar? 
then the, that, that's the real challenge, right? And that's, I think, where the role for local government comes in, um, the role for a coordinated effort. Um, obviously, within um, Bemidji's um, you know, City and Sustainability Commission, I think that would be a great project to kind of think about and have a test pilot neighborhood to think about what that looks like. Um, I know that that kind of consideration is happening all the time, um, especially for bigger projects in bigger cities, and I absolutely know that uh, Bemidji could step up and think about how to co-locate that. Um, and you know, the beautiful thing, one of the other things that um, uh, they talked about um, uh, with the other solutions that I'm a big fan of is something called agrovoltaics, or agrovoltaic, and it's this idea that you can um, have uh, a successful farm and also solar panels right alongside of it too. So if farmers can do it, I know our neighborhoods can too, and it's just all about intentionally planning. Yeah, Lisa. Okay, smart meters. Are they really smart, and do they really um, save, elect you know, save electricity? Um, I know right now Otter Tail is pushing them, and I'm one of the many people who do not believe that they are safe and do not cause health issues. But with Otter Tail, they're saying, oh, it's going to save all this money. But at the same time, I, if I want to opt out, I have to pay a $225 one-time fee plus an $80 uh, month um, charge, which for most of the time, unless it's the dead of winter, is more than my electric bill. And I guess, you know, if it's smart meters are gonna save the planet, maybe it's worth it. But is there that much? that they can really save the planet and save me all this money. Yeah. If I had to summarize, smart meters, what's up with them? Um, obviously, I think you've got a great point also about kind of the- And I am not a conspiracy theorist. Yes. No, we know and love you for who you are, Lisa. Good. Yeah. I think it's a valid question. And I think, that, you know, I'm happy to pass the mic too for other uh, smart meter fanatics or skeptics. Um, but I think the real benefit of the smart meter comes from individual behavior change being made mindful from seeing that lifetime display and then visualizing how you yourself are incentivized to make the change. The smart meter isn't going to set up your house to immediately make those changes itself. In, in my kind of experience, it's much more of a helpful visualization tool for the consumer to think through and notice, oh wow, right now you know it's 2 a.m and you know, I'm still drawing all this energy or my thermostats at this level, how can I be more efficient and mindful of how I'm using energy? And so again, it's a tool that you have the ability to use. Uh, I don't know if it's worth that much, uh, you know, $80 or whatever a month, but that's if you opt out, I guess. Uh, does anyone else have smart meter thoughts? I just, I just had one put in. Yeah, what's your experience? Uh, well, I don't know. I was just put in two days ago. Okay. <laughs> Keep us posted. <laughs> if you're a convert. And, and that is not uh, fair for that level of being opted out. Dan, I see your hand next. This might be a question more for Beltrami Electric, but do the upcoming uh, incentives, how do they mesh with Beltrami Electric existing incentives for these appliances? Is there a conflict? And yeah. then uh, for Lisa, in terms of smart meters, the data is already coming through your home anyway, because every neighbor that you have, it, the, yeah. the data is already on the line. So whether yeah, you have a meter or not, doesn't impact your health. But when my meter is here, there's a little tiny room here. My bedroom is here. Yeah. It's not that far from where you, most people spend much time. Read the data, they okay. are not safe. Yeah. So yeah, um, I would say, the hope was that we staged the two sessions. I was not at the last one. So whoever did attend the one with BE, I'm not, uh, you know, Beltrami Electric and all the other providers. I'm assuming that a lot of these are trying to be stackable benefits, but can anyone confirm that from last time? Yes. Susie or Jordan, whoever? It's very true that they're stackable. Yeah, they're definitely stackable. We got uh, federal benefits from solar and geothermal as well as local benefits, uh, just a straight check from them for um, geothermal and induction stove. Nice. Okay. While you're walking up, I'll just add they're so intended to be stackable that actually the federal provision is you have to list it at the discounted price. 
if you get a rebate from the utility, you have to list what your net price was for your appliance, oh, and okay. you get your federal tax credit on that net price. Okay. Oh, okay. That's a lot of Thank you, Pat. Yeah. All right. So my question is that currently, if you put in solar panels, your electricity is guaranteed at a certain price. My question is, is this guaranteed in the future, or can they change how they reimburse the electricity that you generate? With net metering, kind of, or? Um, just, as I understand that they are paying you current rate. Mm -hmm. Is that current rate guaranteed into the future, or can they reduce that rate in the future? That is, that's a great question. I know it's utility specific. I, I don't have experience myself with the agreement on Beltrami Electric. Does anyone have kind of uh, their own experience with it? You want to speak first on that? Thank you for naming that. Yeah. I think that's that's also really governed by the net metering law for the state of Minnesota. You know that net metering law for uh, solar and wind projects that are 40 kW or or smaller. The utility pays what's what's basically the retail rate. Our agreement, we have a 10k system, 10 kW system. Our retail rate, um, I think it's called the average rate. So it is what it is. You know, we might pay 11.4 cents and we get reimbursed 10.8 cents. It's it's a little bit less than the full retail rate, but it's I think it's called their average average retail rate. But I think the guarantee or the longevity of that is the legislative action that put in place that net metering rule for the state of Minnesota. That's my understanding. Anything else want to add to that? Because it's based on the average rate, it is conceivable that the utilities could lower the mm -hmm. energy prices in the future, and then that av right. that average rate could go down. Basically, what Beltrami Electric has now is roughly ten cents. Per kilowatt hour, if you're generating through a solar array, that they'll pay you. That's the rate that Linda was referring to. But you can also go to 12 cents to get reimbursed at that rate or credit if you, you know, still owe. The disincentive of that one is if at, in December <laughs> you haven't used up all your credits, they're going to just absorb them. So you get two cents more per kilowatt hour but you have to gamble that you haven't have use of some left unused where they're not going to carry them over to the next year. Excellent. All right, I'm mindful of time. Any one last question out there for now? Yes. Regarding planting trees, is there a source for trees that are better than others to plant? And especially given that our our winter was pretty warm, and I'm worried about trees that I have being stressed yes. you know, from the higher temps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, tree stress is obviously the biggest risk for having a successful forestation project. Period. But I would say uh, the local soil, water, and conservation districts tree sale every year are uh, wonderful experts. Phil Betrami County. Uh, Arbor Day Foundation, there's a whole bunch of other places online where you can kind of see your hardiness zone. They've already started to incorporate uh, climate change in shifting kind of the zones of where uh, certain trees are best met. Uh, but starting with the Soil, Water, and Conservation District kind of um, tree sale for Beltrami County that I know happens every spring, uh, if you just go online right now, I'm sure they're accepting orders and that would be a great first step to talk to a local expert that knows a lot more. That's a great question. All right, so let's do this um, because I promised that we would do uh, three things and then uh, we'll get you out of here on time and on our budget still. Um, and they are this. I want us all to be invited to think about talking more about this in our lives after tonight, taking action, and then getting involved, however you see that fit. And uh, actually, I'll just share this really quick too. So this is a graphic that we just put together this month for CCL's campaign on climate conversations. How many people here have heard of this concept called the spiral of climate silence before? It's real. All right, so basically what happens is, you can see this really well mapped out. We are basically in this loop 
where we don't hear about other people talking about climate change, so we don't talk about climate change, so no one talks about climate change, and so forth. But then the compounding factor on that, which is really the hard part, is that we see things getting worse around us, and we still hear people talking about it. And I think this is shifting, you know, warranted. Uh, but basically then we must, we think that it must not be that as big of a deal as we hear it being made of because it isn't talked about as much as it should or could be if it really is that bad. Um, so let's all break that together. Uh, I know that we already are, uh, but one of the things that we're inviting you in uh, for Earth Month, uh, CCL's big campaign has been having 25,000 conversations about climate change. If you want to find out more, just go to cclusa.org slash conversations. You can just Google that too if you want. Uh, we've got kind of a whole framework. Uh, one of our favorite advisors is a, a faith leader and a climate scientist named Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Um, and she kind of uh, launched our whole campaign um, and talked about how you start with the heart, you bring in the head, and you end with the hands. So how, you know, how can you connect on a human-to-human -human level with shared values? How can you share then your concern for the impacts you're seeing? And how can you leave people not just hanging out there feeling doom and gloom, but like, hey, let's get engaged together and do something proactively, right, with your hands. So that's one of those things. Um, if you want to, CCL has some great action tools that are updated every month that we help kind of roll out on these campaigns. This is just a screenshot for one of our um, kind of action campaigns. And basically, we, uh, it's just uh, another link that I can provide or say out loud here, cclusa.org slash action. Every month, you can basically do an action to contact Congress. You can do an action kind of in your own lives, and then we've got kind of social media to amplify too. So if you want to find it more, you can do that. And the thing that I'd love to highlight here, I didn't uh, get the chance to add this too, is that uh, there's additional work being done across all of the co-sponsors tonight. So my email is really easy to remember. Uh, obviously, tonight, uh, after tonight, I'd love to stay in touch uh, with anyone that wants to talk any of the things we covered or obviously just stay in touch given that it's been uh, too long since I've seen so many of you. Uh, but CCL Bemidji's uh, next meeting uh, is coming up. You can find out details on Facebook. If you'd like to find out, you can also talk to Linda and Paul in the back. Uh, Bemidji Indivisible is also meeting upcoming soon. And the best website for that event is BemidjiIndivisible.org. IndivisibleBemidji.org. IndivisibleBemidji.org. All right. I will right. reorient that uh, for the slide for future people. They're going to the slide deck too. So IndivisibleBemidji.org. And then I know um, the BSU Sustainability Office always does an amazing job on Earth Month and Earth Week. And that's coming up next week. And if you have any questions about uh, what to expect and how to get more involved. You can talk to Jordan in the back or Anna or anyone else that's obviously uh, been involved uh, in planning a lot of that. So without further ado though, we are at time um, and that is the end of my deck. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.